Greetings. My name is Carlos Salinas, and I am the Regional Director for the U.S. Soybean Export Council in the Americas. Thank you for joining us today. It is a pleasure to have you join us in this event where we will look at the sampling and grading procedures for soybeans set in place by the Federal Grain Inspection Services of the USDA. Quality is an important factor for U.S. soy. Making sure that our global customers well understand the process is even more important. In the U.S., soybean quality is graded by the Federal Grain Inspection Services. This grading process is handled independently by FGIS agents with no involvement from the shipper, buyer, seller, broker, or any other party. It is a very independent process. I think this is very important to highlight as soybeans from other origins may be graded by an independent surveyor of seller's choice, generally paid by the seller. Obviously, this is a different type of relationship. To better understand the sampling and grading process for U.S. soybeans at the port of origin, USEC has contracted an expert. We have contracted the services of Global Agricultural Consulting, LLC. Global Agricultural Consultant provides its clients with grain quality, food safety, and grain storage technical assistance. The firm's goal is to add value to its client's business through expert assistance in the areas of grain storage and handling, food safety, grain inspection, and sampling, as well as working with the U.S. export grain industry in addressing international pesticide issues, sanitary and phytosanitary issues. Arvid Hawk, president of Global Agriculture, Agriculture Consulting, is a 52-year veteran of the grain industry. Hawk retired from Cargill in October of 2006 after a 41-year career with the firm where he specialized in grain quality, food safety, and sanitary and phytosanitary issues. From 1980 to 2006, uh, Hawk served as a grain handling coordinator for the Plant Operations Department of Cargill's Commodity Marketing Division, now North American Grain or World Grain Trading Group. In this capacity, Hawk provided company grain merchants and facility operations managers advice on technical contracts and tender terms, grain conditions, storage sampling, inventory measurement and management, federal government grain inspection, and international food safety and sanitary phytosanitary issues. In addition, he filled the roles of facility security officer and food safety officer for his business unit. Hawk has traveled widely through his career, uh, traveling overseas frequently as a member of various industry and government teams, as well as for Cargill. The purpose of the teams was to solve problems dealing with such matters as fumigation, wheat seeds, phytosanitary issues, food safety, including pesticides, MRLs, and quality issues, as well as to promote grain exports. It is my pleasure to have and to host Mr. Arvid Hawk. I appreciate your participation today. Thanks for joining us. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I am Arvid Hawk, owner of Global Agricultural Consulting, LLC. I do consulting with USSAC on technical issues that affect the U.S. soybean exports, especially pesticide MRLs. Today, I will be discussing the U.S. grain export system from an operational point of view. I retired in 2006 after 41 years as a technical expert for Cargill's grain business. Since 2006, I have worked with my clients on the same basic issues as I did with Cargill. My areas of expertise are U.S. and international sanitary and phytosanitary rules, grain quality, grain storage, grain drying, dust control, mycotoxins, and anything of a technical nature having to do with the storage and handling of grain. 
I have been an expert witness on several lawsuits. It is my pleasure to present this information about the U.S. grain export business today. Today, I will be discussing the following subjects. A description of the U.S. grain export system by vessel. A description of a typical New Orleans Gulf export elevator. How vessel quality is determined. The basics of load orders. Sampling basics. Inspection basics. The QSIM loading plan the average loading plan, and a brief summary. How does the grain system work? This slide shows the complexity of the grain movement within the U.S. As can be seen, grain that is moving toward export can be diverted to domestic use at many different points. The organizations involved in U.S. grain exports are the private free enterprise companies who execute the sales, USDA, FGIS, the Federal Grain Inspection Service, provides both quality and quantity certification, USDA, APHIS, Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service, provides phytosanitary certificates. In summary, the grain export system is efficient, flexible, reliable. It provides a uniform product. It's cost effective and has the ability to adjust quality to meet contract requirements and maintain uniformity of that quality by blending from several different bins. This is a map of the soybean flow being exported from the U.S. As can be seen, the export break down roughly as follows. 63.6% from the New Orleans Gulf, 22% from the Pacific Northwest, 11% from the East Coast, and 4% from the Texas Gulf. Shipping grain by vessel appears to be fairly simple, but it is far from that. The simple part is the product is commingled from several different bins to adjust the quality and the uniformity of that quality to meet contract specifications. Even though we do our best to load a uniform product, because our product segregates, especially when it moves into the vessel, it may appear to not be uniform when it reaches the destination. This it is a picture of a fairly typical U.S. Gulf vessel export facility. Note the incline belt conveyors. These are used to replace vertical bucket elevators, which have been related to grain explosions and breakage of grain, especially corn, during handling. Here's a flow diagram of a typical export facility. In order to get it on one slide, it depicts a bucket elevator on the left side. But this is most likely an incline belt conveyor. The blue line shows the product coming from the storage rail or barge receiving up the conveyor through the sampler and scale system to the shipping bin. Here it will be held until FGIS has accepted it as having met load order grade. 
If it meets grade, it will travel via the yellow line. If it does not meet grade, it will be released to the elevator to be returned to grain storage bins. Here's a flow sheet of the receiving shown in blue and the shipping shown in yellow of a typical export facility. Note the sampler at the uh, ahead of the scale system. This is a flow sheet of the barge receiving system. Again, note the sampler just ahead of the scale system. This facility moves loaded barges into a covered shed so rain will not get into the grain. The barge covers are removed and the unloading mechanism is lowered into the barge. When enough grain has been removed behind the unloading leg, a bucket type loader is lowered into the barge and cleanup begins. As shown in this photograph, as the barge unloader shown on the left has nearly completed its job, and the bobcat has also nearly completed its job with the cleanup of the barge. This device being used simply opens the gate at the, on the bottom of the rail car so the grain can flow into the rail pit and on into the elevator. The bullet-shaped device on the end of the ship loading spout is a mechanism to reduce the amount of dust released into the environment. Here we show the topping off of the hold and leveling the grain surface. This is necessary to keep the vessel in trim during the voyage. Now I'd like to delve more deeply into the vessel export inspection procedures. It begins with a contract between the buyer and seller. The seller may not be the same as a loading facility. Most export contracts are based on the U.S. grain standards as developed by the Federal Grain Inspection Service. The buyer may specify more stringent criteria or criteria not determined by FGIS. This is most likely going to command a premium. If it is something FGIS cannot or the contract does not specify as FGIS determined, an independent agency can be used at an additional cost. The contract should specify any services wanted from FGIS that are not required by the law. The next step in the process is for the loading facility to give FGIS a load order in writing so both sides understand what is needed. This load order must follow the contract. It must state the contracted quantity and quality, the sublot size wanted by the elevator, the options wanted such as special criteria and certification option wanted. There's two options. Option number one, as an example, is U.S. number two yellow soybeans. Option number two is U.S. number two or better yellow soybeans. Any other pertinent information such as number and size of sealed samples required. The basic export services provided by FGIS are storage examinations, monitoring grain movement, weighing, sampling, inspection, and certification. 
There are two storage exams in most all cases. The first storage exams usually done at anchor prior to bringing the vessel to birth. This is so that the vessel has a chance to correct any deficiencies before tying up the berth. The inspection is to determine if the storage areas are clean, dry, free of infestation, rodents, toxic substances, and foreign odor, and suitable to store or carry bulk grain or oil seeds. Another storage exam is done once the vessel is birthed to make sure the vessel corrected the deficiencies and the holes are still clean, dry, and free of insects. FGIS has cameras located at strategic points so they can monitor the sampling, weighing, and loading process. Periodic personal on-site inspections are also made. Moving on to sampling bases. The sampling system looks much like this, but there may be two secondary dividers. The sampler is called a diverter type or DT sampler and is installed directly into a grain spout. It has a device called a diverter that periodically moves across the full width of the grain stream diverting a portion out of the grain stream for a sample. A timer that activates the diverter is set for every 15 to 30 seconds, depending on the loading rate of the facility. The picture on the left depicts the diverter passing through the grain stream. The picture on the right shows a different design of a diverter type sampler. This design is not often used. Vessel shipping samplers are supposed to be as near the end of the shipping spout as possible. That is seldom possible. In the system shown here, the sampler acts as both the receiving and shipping sampler. It is located above the scale system. Grain comes from the bins, rail or barge receiving, and goes to the shipping bins. When the product is approved by FGIS, it is allowed to pass on to the vessel. DT samplers must be designed to suit the intended official use of the sampling system. FGIS must authorize the system for use. It must meet FGIS design specs, some of which are the diverter must tra traverse at one half a meter per second. It must meet the power source requirements by FGIS, the size requirements, control, controllers, timers, and so forth. And it must be installed according to manufacturer and FGIS requirements. Also, the sample transport system must be shown to not affect the sample condition. Timers must be accurate to plus or minus one division. Timers are not to be changed during official sampling and various sampling rates based on grain flow and desired metric tons per cut. And last, provides more uniform samples than other types of samples. Here's a table of the timer settings for grain flow rates from 254 to 1,143 metric tons per hour. 
and a continuation on this table for grain flow rates from 1,270 to 3,175 metric tons per hour. How much sample is taken? Each facility is a little different, but on the facility I'm describing, there are 540 kilograms per component sample with four components, providing 2,160 kilograms of sample per sublot, or 2.16 metric ton. This takes, this vessel takes 38 sublots at 2.16 metric tons, equals 82.08 metric tons of sample is taken by the primary sampler. Using the proper dividers, the inspection, the inspector reduces the sample to 1,500 grams per component. The four component samples are combined to 6,000 grams and further reduced to two 1,700 gram samples. One as the work sample and one for the file sample. This is a flow sheet showing us the, the samples that are taken. Here's the ship lot. You take the component samples, combine them for a sublot sample, and then you combine the sublot samples for a vessel sample, if needed. In this case, there are four component samples, each representing 400 metric tons, a sublot of 1,600 metric tons. For component samples, official inspection personnel visually examine the component samples to determine whether any factor exceeds the grade limit or the declared grade by more than one numerical grade. If a component sample does not appear to meet the inspection criteria, official personnel must analyze the component sample for the non-uniform factor. If the factor result or results does not exceed the inspection criteria, the component sample is combined with other uniform component samples and graded as a sublot. When a component sample factor result exceeds the grade limit by more than one numerical grade or contains a condition not included in the load order, for example, heating odor, distinctly low quality, and so forth, after the factor analysis, the grain represented by that component sample is declared a material portion. A sublot sample representing 60,000 bushels or a thousand metric ton is composed of the four uniform component samples. It is divided down to about 3,400 grams. These 3,400 grams are divided in half for a 1,700 gram work sample and a 1,700 gram file sample. This will collect more samples. FGIS will collect more samples at the request of the loading facility if desired. The work sample is cut into one 1,050 gram sample to be used to determine the grade and six, a 650 gram sample to determine the moisture content. FGS uses an inspection log that contains the vessel name, the shipper, the destination, the grade requirements, the factor results, and QSUM by sublot. The stowage, in other words, where each sublot goes on the vessel, which hold, and the final grade. 
types of loading plans are the QSUM, component loading, average grade, an example of a tighter factor is number four yellow soybeans, but specifying a maximum of 3% FM. You can also have max or sublot. I will only discuss the QSUM, the average grade and component sampling in this presentation. The QSUM loading plan is a class of statistical procedures for assessing where, when, or whether or not a process is in control. In this case, the, is, uh, does the elevator have control of what it's doing in its mixing and blending process? It also enforces a level of uniformity of product quality during loading. It uses grade limits, breakpoints, and starting values to determine if a sublot of grain meets contract requirements. It involves a comparison between inspection results and grade slash contract limits. The QSUM value is calculated for each factor in a sublot to determine if the grain is uniform. The QSUM allows grain to be loaded that appears to exceed the contract requirements within the certain limits called the breakpoints. A material portion is called when any factor that has a QSUM value exceeding the allowable breakpoint or is U.S. sample grade. A starting value shortened to SV is needed for each factor. The SV is the value the QSUM starts at. It is based on the breakpoint value from an FGIS chart. A breakpoint shortened to BP is that QSUM value that signifies a misgrade. It is statistically determined and is based on the grade factors. FGIS has tables that provide the SV and BP values for all grains. They are in the FGIS Grain Inspection Handbook, Book 3, which is available on the FGIS website. I have provided this soybean starting value and breakpoint table. I'm not going to spend any time trying to go through it, but it's available to you if you want it. The QSUM value is calculated for each factor in a sublot to determine if the grain meets the contracted for grade and is uniform in quality. You calculate the QSUM in two steps. Step one, determine the factor deviation by subtracting the grade limit from the inspection result. Step two, add the factor deviation to the previous QSUM value. For factors with maximum limits, QSUM is never less than zero. Examples of those factors are moisture content, damage kernels total, and foreign material. For factors with minimum limits, QSUM is never greater than zero. An example there is test weight. Here's an abbreviated loading log showing a material portion. Sublot 3 is an MP because the QSUM for FM is 0 0.4. 
circled in red in the bottom right hand corner, while the breakpoint is 0 0.3. The facility can either remove the sublot or ask for a reinspection called a Rex and a board appeal. Sort of remember this slide because I'm going to refer to it in a, in a subsequent slide. Material portions are those parts of the loadings that did not meet the QSUM requirements. Again, they can be component samples whose factor analysis result exceeds the specified grade limit by more than one grade or has odor and so forth. Or a sublot sample where any factor that has a QSUM value which exceeds the allowable breakpoint or is U.S. sample grade. If a material portion is declared, the facility is allowed one reinspection, as I said before, and one board appeal. The applicant for its service may specify that official personnel perform review inspection service on only one only the factor that caused the material portion or on multiple factors results. Board appeals are seldom asked for because the sample may have to go to Kansas City, Missouri, because that's where the Board of Appeals is and may take a day or so. In order for a Rex result to replace the original result, a material error must have occurred. Otherwise, the two results are averaged. A material error is a difference between the two results in excess of two standard deviations. FGIS has charts laying this out for all grains and all factors. A board appeal inspection supersedes a lower level of inspection. In the example I've been presenting, the facility manager felt it was to his advantage to call a Rex on these three factors, even though only one was an MP. In the reinspection, the test weight went from 54.7 down to 54, a loss, but, the, but this was not a problem because the contract called for 54.0. The damaged kernels total went from 3.7 to 2.4, again, a gain to the facility. The FM went from 2.3 to 2.1. From a previous slide, the FM QSIM was 0 0.4, or over the breakpoint of 0 0.3. This result now res reduces the QSIM to 0 0.3, which is the breakpoint, and the sublot now passes. QSIM can be used with the component samples. QSIM values are computed the same as with sublot samples. However, all breakpoint values are reduced. You're a little closer to going off grade. Component loading is where the loading facility wants the QSIM to apply to component samples instead of sublot samples. It can be done on a factor by factor basis. The pros are there is a reduced variability associated with the sublot results because the component inspection results are averaged 
to obtain the sublot inspection result. You are relying on four samples instead of just one. Or the elevator may want to maximize his blending capabilities. Items against using component analysis. The breakpoint values assigned to the factors analyzed on a component sample basis are reduced to reflect the reduced variability associated with the sublot results. The starting value and material error are based on the breakpoint and are assigned using the reduced breakpoint. To summarize component sampling analysis, the inspection results are averaged to obtain the sublot inspection value. FGIS must be notified as soon as possible that component analysis is going to be used. Once loading begins, you cannot change factors analyzed or withdraw the request for component analysis. The breakpoint is based on the number of component samples analyzed. The more components, the lower the breakpoint. Component loading MPs. An MP is declared when the inspection result exceeds the more than one grade limit requirement. Odor is detected or any other unusual deleterious products. The average of the component results causes the QSIM value to exceed the reduced breakpoint. Why would you want to use component loading? There is a reduced variability associated with the sublot results. The elevator wants to maximize its blending capabilities or the elevator simply has a problem and feels that component analysis will help him resolve it. The average loading process is quite simple. There is no QSIM. All grade factors are taken on average. The final grade for the lot or sublot must be at or better than contract specs. Here's the kicker. It is the shipper's responsibility to maintain a final grade average to meet the contract specs. Thank you for your attention, and I will turn you over to your moderator. Dear Arvid, on behalf of the U.S. Soybean Export Council, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for explaining to us and to our audience uh, the U.S. grain export system, uh, its process, uh, the sampling and grading methodology that is being used. I do believe we have a very transparent process uh, where we have the contributions from Federal Grain Inspection Services that guarantees uh, that the quality being reported is the actual quality of the cargo. Once again, uh, thank you for your time, and I would like to thank our audience for taking the time to watch this video. Thank you.